class to read what's up there now. <laughs> Yay, the green card's up. Welcome to all of those online. Let us come to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, give us grace to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily and to follow Christ, to discipline our bodies and keep them under control, Lord. Keep us from being lovers of ourselves, from being wise in our own eyes and leaning to our own understanding. Lord, give us to seek not our own good only, but also the good of our neighbor and grant that we may not live to ourselves or die to ourselves, but whether we live or die, we may be the Lord's and may live and die to him. We honor and glorify your name by the grace of your Son, Jesus the Christ, as we pray the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, for our announcements, you can read up there, which isn't up there yet, but it's coming. We have Monday, March the 22nd at 6.30, men's group. And Wednesday, we have prayer time at 6.30. What about Monday? Do we still have the men there? Oh, okay. The last two sessions of the six-week Bible study Fight Back with Joy, March the 11th and the 18th at 6.30. That's look a little bit ahead of us. Are there any other announcements? Okay, you know today's the day. We have a very special person to be with us. This is his last Sunday with us. So let's, let's welcome him with a real applause. Thank you, Linda. Well, we do want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online. We're always appreciative uh, for technology, you know, to make that uh, happen. So we want to welcome you. Um, before I actually get into my sermon, I just want to say it has been my honor and privilege to share with you over the past nine months. Uh, as someone who works at uh, the college, I see a lot of churches, I really do. And this is a good church. Don't let anyone tell you any different. This is a good church. And I have now, and never judge a church just by the size of a church. It's by the quality of the members within the congregation. And I can't believe how many of you are always willing to serve in some capacity or another as a worship leader, a diaconate, uh, an elder on committees, Bible study leaders. Um, it's just really amazing. And so I hope and pray that you continue to serve and to be willing to serve in that way. And I know that Dr. Shaw, when he gets here, is going to, you know, lead you into you know, good things and uh, to a deeper understanding of the word and uh, the mission of the church. So um, 
It's been my honor and privilege uh, to uh, share with you this really short journey, and I'm excited for you as you, uh, you go from here. So this is my sermon for this morning. Listen carefully. Ooh, musha, kumo, kuna, bog pubo, wa ne, pulia nob, ta ha, beme, ba, wufo, wa, hot god, a yain job, samak nob. All right, thank you. <laughs> Anybody have a clue what I said? It's raining outside. Uh, no, that's not. I didn't say it was raining outside, although it is, all right. Anybody know what language that was I was speaking? Klingon, because he read my notes in the back, all right. He's a cheater, all right. That was Klingon. And that was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life in Klingon. Now, for those of you who don't know, all right, Klingon is a fictional race of people that was developed specifically by Gene Roddenberry for the Star Trek series. And Gene Roddenberry actually hired a Ph.D. linguist to develop the language of Klingon so that it actually followed all the rules of grammar and syntax. So you might that think that that's a little strange, my coming out here and quoting scripture in Klingon. Let me tell you what prompted this. When I was still working for Christ in Youth, this was about 2001, 2002, and I was leading a big conference uh, out east in uh, Milligan, Tennessee. And every morning I'd get up early, go get my breakfast, I'd get a copy of USA Today, and I'd read through the news. And if you get USA Today, there's always this section in the middle where there's always some little bitty news blurb about all 50 states. And I always kind of find that interesting to see what's going on in all 50 states. And I always would look to see what was going on in Oregon. Because that's where my wife and I grew up. You know, we spent 20 years there, same little town in Oregon. And this particular uh, day, the little news bite was from uh, Portland, Oregon, the Department of Human Services, which serves about 60,000 mental health care clients. And they actually took out an ad in the, in the local newspaper for a position that was available in their organization. And in 2001, it would pay $40,000 a year. And the position was for a caseworker and interpreter. And you had to be fluent in Klingon. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Why would you have to do that? So I did some investigation, and I found that the, the behavioral health laws say that if you have a client, you must speak to them in their preferred language. So that makes sense, you know, if you've got someone whose first language is Spanish, you want to speak to them in Spanish so that they get it. Or if it's German or Chinese or Japanese. But I'm like, Klingon? I mean, that's not even real people. You know, it's Star Trek. Well, I found out that there were a lot of, of families that were on welfare that did not have jobs, didn't want jobs, and they were all Trekkies so much so that they just learned how to speak Klingon and they taught Klingon to their children and that's all they spoke in the home was Klingon. And that's why they needed a caseworker who was fluent in English and Klingon. 
Now, that's just the beginning of what I learned about Klingon fanatics. Since 1994, in Red Lake Falls, Minnesota, you can pay good money to be a part of a two-week language camp where you focus on nothing but learning how to speak Klingon. Local city officials even surrender the town over to the Klingon Empire for the time during that two-week camp. Besides the two-week camp in Red Lake, Minnesota, I found out there's a Klingon language conference held in rural Pennsylvania. So at this conference, everybody who attends is called upon to take the stage, and they either tell jokes in Klingon, make tongue twisters in Klingon, watch a Klingon opera, and they strive to improve their pronunciation so they can speak Klingon fluently without any trace of Terran. That means earth, all right? So when the Klingon Language Institute first met, only seven people showed up. In 1997, all right, 24 years ago, it had 1,600 members. They publish a quarterly scholarly journal called Coquette. It's a report released by the Modern Language Association. You ready for this? this is the latest. I just found this out several weeks ago. Fluent speakers of Klingon in the United States now outnumber the individuals who are fluent in Navajo by seven to one. So think about that. There are seven times more people who are fluent in Klingon, which is a fictional language, than Navajo, which is actually a real language of Native Americans. There's a Google search engine just for Klingon. I kid you not. There's an official dictionary for Klingon. It's in its seventh edition, and it's been published in five different languages. You can download Klingon fonts for your computer. And there's a website for the Klingon Imperial Diplomatic Corps if you want to join. So let me give you a flash of insight here, okay? Reality check. It's not real. It's not real. <laughs> but do you know what I have in my hand here? I have in my hand all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, and Revelation, all accurately, meticulously translated into Klingon. But what's really sad of the 6,500 real languages representing real people groups in the world today, more than 4,500 have absolutely no portion of Scripture for them to read. But be encouraged, people. We've got Klingon! Now, don't misunderstand me. I like Star Trek movies as well as the next guy. Okay? I think Wrath of Khan was my favorite. Anybody, Wrath of Khan was your favorite? All right. Maybe the Save the Whales one or Search for Spock. I, I don't know. But uh, Wrath of Khan was my favorite. So I, I enjoy Star Trek. But to invest your life and to spend thousands of dollars just to learn to speak a fictional language of a fictional people is just a little beyond me. Not that there would be anything sinful or wrong about learning to speak Klingon. It's just here's the bottom line for me. 
I want my life to count for something of eternal significance. For something that's going to outlast my life. I don't want to waste my life. Anybody with me on that? But I came upon this realization. Wasting your life isn't limited to just spending valuable time and money learning how to speak Klingon. Because you're wasting your life. If you are spending all of your time and all of your energy and all of your dreams on yourself instead of on Jesus and serving others. That's just how simple it is. Listen to the words of Jesus. Reading from Luke 9, verses 23 through 25. And then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone's ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. All three verbs in verse 23, where it says that you must uh, deny yourself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny, take up, and follow. All right, all three of those verbs are in the imperative. So if you, if you don't get grammar, all right, what that simply means is when they are in the imperative mode, it means that they are commands. They are not options. We must, we are commanded, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we must deny ourselves, we must take up his cross daily, and we must follow him. But here's also what's interesting. Those come, they are in the imperative, but the first two, the call to deny ourselves and to take up our cross, in the Greek, it's in aorist tense. And what that means is that it took place at one point in time in the past. It was completed action. But the verb for follow me, to follow Jesus, is in the present tense. Which means it is to be continuous action. So what that's trying, that little grammar lesson, what that's trying to say is, Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you had to have at one point made the decision, you're going to deny yourself. And you're going to take up his cross. But every single day, you're going to make that decision to continue to follow him. So discipleship means that we have to follow that, that commitment of self-denial, bearing one's cross while we, we follow Jesus constantly. Discipleship is a basic shift of our orientation as we align ourselves with God's will through a humble renunciation of our own agenda for our life. To gain the whole world means that all provision, power, and property that the world can provide is available to us. It's kind of like our idiom, someone says, man, that guy's got the world by the tail. You ever heard of that? They got the world by the tail. And it's like, yeah, everything in the world is available to them. Every possession, every position, yeah, they've got it. But to Jesus, 
It makes no sense to live that way. Because if all you're striving for is to have all the things that the world offers and you're neglecting the eternal, that really makes you a loser at life. The call for us to walk differently from the walk of the world is just as essential of an attribute of discipleship today as it was when Jesus first uttered those words. A walk of integrity, purity, faithfulness, humble service should be just as evident in our lives today as it was in the lives of the 12 apostles in Jesus' day. If we're too comfortable in this world, and if no one can look at us and see that our lives are different, maybe that means we've not taken the full journey into discipleship that Christ calls us to take. Materialism, the pursuit of power, pleasure, security, I think those are probably the biggest obstacles to spiritual advancement. Everything in our culture, from our commercials to our educational process, pushes us in the direction of advancing our standard of living and our own personal comfort. To pick up one's cross goes against the grain of our cultural values. Goes against our own expectations and our own needs. We take all of those and we say, I'm putting those in the back seat. And I'm letting Jesus get in the front seat and drive my life where he will. Did any of you ever watch that reality program called The Biggest Loser? Anybody remember The Biggest Loser? And, you know, when that thing first came out, they were advertising, we're going to have this new show, The Biggest Loser. Who wants to be on that show? And I remember thinking, oh, who would want to be on The Biggest Loser? I mean, I already feel bad enough, you know. I already have low self-esteem. That would just crush me, all right, to end up being The Biggest Loser. But you have to understand, it was about learning how to eat healthy and to exercise and to lose weight that, that people had accumulated to a very unhealthy level. And so the person who ended up losing the most weight, so the biggest loser, actually ended up the pro winning the prize of $250,000 and hopefully learning how to eat you know, in a more healthy way and to incorporate exercise into their life. And so, in reality, the biggest loser was really the biggest winner. I think that's just a great illustration of what Jesus was trying to teach us in Luke chapter 9. The person who loses for the sake of the kingdom of God, in the end, really ends up winning. At the end of the movie Braveheart, which is one of my favorite movies, the wife of the heir to the throne of England is pleading with William Wallace to confess and to save his life and avoid immediate death by torture. But Wallace replies to her, and he says, All men die. Not all men live. In saying this, Wallace was sharing the truth that life is more than just human existence. Life consists in what you live for and, if need be, what you're willing to die for. You know, I've heard a lot of college students decide to drop out of school you know they they come to my office door and they knock on it and i say come in because that's what you do when someone knocks on your door it's just it's proper it's just good etiquette so they come in they sit down and they say well dr zeus i want to thank you for the classes i just want you to know i'm not going to be here in the fall 
Now, I usually know what they're going to say. But just to play along, I say something like, pray tell, why aren't thou going to be in class in the fall? And they will say, I've got to go find myself. And I'm thinking, so you're not going to be in class because you need to go find yourself. Ah, oh, dude, yeah, that's it. I think I can help with that. Really? Yeah, you're sitting in my office, 1111 North Main, you jerk. All right, now sign up for fall classes. All right. But I don't say that because that would be really weird and unprofessional. But that's what I want to say. <laughs> Oh, Jill, you never had that problem with kindergartners, you know. That was the advantage, all right, you know. <laughs> they love school, all right. Oh, and, and I always try to tell them, all right, that's never this search to go find yourself. You don't find yourself. You find yourself by losing yourself in the kingdom of God. You find your life by pursuing it, by following after Jesus. You find it by losing your life into something, or better, someone greater than yourself. You find your life by losing it to Jesus and the work of the kingdom of God. I try to get that through their thick skulls of mush, but sometimes it's impossible. In order to waste your life, you don't have to be involved in things that are illegal or immoral, like drugs, sex, murder, rape. All you have to do is just be selfish, believing that all of life is centered upon you, and your own pleasure, and your own goals, and your own happiness. It's really, really easy to let life slip by. And you don't plan to waste it, but if you don't purposely set out every day to serve Jesus and others, it will end up wasted. So listen to these statistics. In an average lifetime, the average American spends three years in business meetings, 13 years watching TV, 89,281 on food, consumes 109,354 pounds of food, makes 1,811 trips to McDonald's. <laughs> Shoot, I did that 20 years ago. <laughs> All right. Spends six thousand eight hundred eighty-one dollars in vending machines. Eats thirty-five thousand one hundred thirty-eight cookies. A thousand four hundred eighty-three pounds of candy. Catches three hundred and four colds. Is involved in six motor vehicle accidents. Is hospitalized eight times for men, twelve times for women, and spends twenty-four hours sleeping. So is that? Is that how you, 24 years, yes, yeah, sleeping. Is that how you want your life to be remembered? Just an accumulation of mundane, unimportant facts and figures? Or do you want your life to stand for something more? The stuff that people think makes life worth living. Money, fame, power. It doesn't really satisfy those who have given their lives in the pursuit of those very things have found themselves to be losers in the end let me tell you about the life of a certain man all this man ever wanted in life was more he wanted more money so he invested his inherited wealth into a billion dollar pile of assets he wanted more fame, so he broke into the Hollywood scene, and he soon became a filmmaker and a star. He wanted more sensual pleasures, so he paid handsome sums of money to indulge his every sexual urge. He wanted more thrills, so he designed, built, and he piloted the fastest aircraft in the world. He wanted more power, so he secretly dealt political favors so skillfully that two U.S. presidents actually became his pawns. 
All he ever wanted was more. And he was absolutely convinced that just having more would bring him true happiness and satisfaction. But unfortunately, history proved otherwise. Because this very man concluded his life emaciated, colorless, a sunken chest, fingernails that were grotesque, you know, inches long corkscrews, rotting black teeth, tumors, and dozens of needle marks because of his drug addiction. Could you figure it out? It was Howard Hughes I'm talking about. He died in 1976 believing the myth of more. He died a billionaire junkie, insane by all reasonable standards. You could say he was one of the world's biggest losers. Now, don't misunderstand me, people. I am not against enjoying life, laughing, or having fun. All right, I guarantee you, you have a party, invite me, I'm going to be in the center of it all, all right? I'm good, I love a good laugh, I love a good party, all right? I'm going to want to know something about everybody. I've got jokes for every occasion, all right? You'll be rolling on the floor, all right? Glad that you invited me, all right? Jill, can I get an amen? Yeah, all right, I've got one, all right, she, she agrees, all right? I'm not against those things. I'm simply saying that living for yourself only does not bring true happiness or purpose or ultimate contentment. It's only when you're willing to give up your life to serve Jesus and others, true life is actually discovered. Some people are consumed with fantasy and they'll spend thousands of dollars to learn the race, the language of a race of people who don't even really exist. I want to be consumed. I want my life to be consumed in becoming more like Jesus every day. I want every aspect of my life to be like Jesus no matter the cost. And if the cost means having to lose my life in order to gain something better, then so be it. I'm willing to be considered the biggest loser by the world's standards. If it means in the end I'm the biggest winner by God's standards. Let me share with you a different story. This is a story about someone who knows what it means to, to be a loser that in the end is really to be a winner. His name's Daniel Huffman. And when he was 17, he stood 6 feet 2 inches tall, weighed 275 pounds, and football meant the world to him. Sterling, you want to recruit this guy? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. He was a defensive lineman for his high school team in Rossville and starter, awards, everything until his senior year. And in July of his senior year, he decided to opt out of his senior year of football because he needed to give his ailing grandmother one of his kidneys. So here's a kid who loved football almost more than life but he set it aside in order to give life to another and people who knew Daniel they, they would tell you that didn't surprise them one bit he was just that kind of kid it wasn't out of character for him to give one of his kidneys to his diabetic grandmother who had raised him since he was in the eighth grade. One Sports Illustrated writer said, you know, it's funny how someone who wasn't even playing could end up being the toughest kid on the team. 
Doctors said he'd recover from the operation and that his kidney, the one remaining kidney, would soon be twice the size that it used to be. Knowing this, the writer for Sports Illustrated said, well, the doctors might be able to measure the size of his kidney, but they still haven't figured out how to measure the size of Daniel's heart. And I think it would be a great story even if it just ended there. But it didn't. Daniel had always dreamed of playing football for Florida State University. Personally, I have to forgive him for that. But, all right, that's where he grew up. And when Daniel donated his kidney, that meant no more football. But during his freshman year of college at Florida State, where do you think he found himself every time there was a ball game? He was there in the middle of the Florida State Seminoles every Saturday afternoon because he was the student trainer. How'd that happen? Bobby Bowden, the ex-coach for Florida State and a, a great Christian man, heard about Daniel's story and his sacrifice. So he arranged for a full scholarship to the university for Daniel, and he gave him the position on the football team of student trainer. And here's the icing on the cake. In 1999, Daniel's story was told in Gift of Love, the Daniel Huffman story, a made-for-TV movie. And so the entire nation was inspired by this one, one man's act of kindness, sacrifice, and love. Following Jesus means being willing to follow him to the cross. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jim Elliott, missionary who was martyred by the Aka Indians, he said it this way, He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim Elliot understood the essence of what it means to be a disciple. You need to choose today. Are you going to live for self? Or are you going to deny yourself and live for the kingdom of God and be the biggest loser? But in the end, the biggest winner. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation Decision, commitment. And if you want to say, I've never really accepted Jesus Christ. I've, there's, I've been living for myself and I'm, I want to live for Jesus. I, I want to be the biggest loser. Today would be a good day to make that decision.
during our communion today, communion meditation, I want to talk about the table of grace, and I will be pulling a verse from uh, Luke 22, it's verse 13. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. The house is noisy and filled with people of all ages and sizes. Wonderful aromas drift in from the kitchen and celebration is in the air. The atmosphere is full of stories being told and memories being shared. There is always something familiar and always something new. I look forward to these shared family gatherings. And family is anyone who arrives and shares in the gathering. Connections are made over birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, and any other excuse to get together. For the same reasons, I also look forward to communion at church. I look forward to sharing the story of Jesus walking down the street to the place where he and his disciples would share a meal. I imagine the disciples getting ready for the Passover feast together. They would be reflecting on the first Passover and they would be wondering how things would go in the upper room Jesus had arranged for them. At the table as they remember God's deliverance from slavery long ago, there is a change in the conversation. Jesus introduces something new, offering a remembrance for the future. He says this meal will mark the beginning of a new covenant. They don't understand, but later they will see that the kingdom of God will include all kinds of people, all who believe in Jesus as the Savior. And this will be a table offering grace for all, and that's worth remembering. May we pray. Dear God, forgive us when we forget. Remind us today of your love and grace. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus that opens the way for us to come to your table. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. And as we sing our closing hymn, uh, we will be released uh, in rows by the diaconate to partake of communion set up in the fellowship hall. Please drop your offering and blessing quarters in the trays by the doors. And please wait to visit with one another till you are out in the parking lot. Thank you.